Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's premier talk show about Gnosticism, Gnosis, the ancient Gnostics, mysteries, historical mysteries, the Templars, Templarism, the Holy Grail, the modern Templars, and anything else we feel like talking about today. My name is Deacon Jonathan Stewart. I'm your host, and I'm joined by my host, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me again. Ah, real pleasure. We got a great show tonight. Uh, we're interviewing uh, John Helsel II on some aspects of Templarism and modern Templarism. Hello, John. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on the podcast. This is a, a distinct privilege. Um, so again, thank you, John. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm used to being on more slipshot of podcasts, so I'll mind my P's and Q's tonight. <laughs> oh, okay, well, we're we're pretty slipshot. Perhaps you might have some competition. We'll see about that, John. We'll see about that. I'm sure we can we can have a slipshot off. Uh, on that topic of half-assed uh, podcasts, Jason. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, uh, I mean, like, w w what are so many of the ways that we get limited by uh, by the archons in our lives? And I think often that's the case of like you know working on podcasts like this in the mm. margins of our lives. You know, in the between bills and, and uh. You know, uh, homework and like all of the all of those limiting features, including money, like uh. you know, money, the money that's required to I hate like, money. pay for server fees and and uh, and like yep. equ hosting equipment and things like that, like. Jonathan, have, have we ever had to deal with that on Talknosis? You know what? Literally every time. And the funny <laughs> thing is, that money stuff, that arconic, horrible force that runs the world, it should be destroyed, in my opinion. But in the meantime, we don't have any of it. And we do, we do need at least some of it to do the show. So we are able to do the show through the generous support of viewers and listeners like you uh, through Patreon.com. Uh, if you go to Patreon.com slash Gnostic, you can donate as little as a dollar per piece of media per month per piece of content. You can also put a cap on that in case we do a lot of content that month so you don't go over your budget. The other thing you can do as well is you can do a one-time donation by going to paypal.com slash Gnostic. Uh, and if you're not able to help us out financially, we completely understand. We're often in similar situations. Uh, you can help us out a lot, uh, just as much, equally as much, by telling people about the show, spreading the word, spreading the logos, capital, capital W on that word, uh, spreading the light of Gnosis. Um, and you can do so just by telling people about the show, like ear to mouth, that works really well. Or, or take your favorite episode and email it to somebody that you think would like it and share it on your social media and like and subscribe on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe on the podcatcher of your choice, leave us good reviews, particularly on the podcatcher. So it's not just for our ego. Good reviews help push us up into the ratings. More people are listening to the show as opposed to watching it. Um, some archons incarnated into this reality and left us some like some poor reviews. So it's up to us, the warriors of light, to, <laughs> to, to fix that. So warriors of light, I'm calling on you. <laughs> okay. Um, one moment here. We can go back to the thing that people actually care about, which is this awesome interview with John. Uh, John, now, now I know this could be, and I say this a lot at the top of the show, I'm going to ask you a question that could be a, a year-long series that people have devoted <laughs> their entire lives to. But if you can do your best to sum it up, John, who were the Templars? Okay, so now keep in mind my my knowledge of it is, I'm, as a Freemason, located mo mostly within those halls. However, as a historical wonk and big fan of the original order, as I refer to them, uh, the original order of the Templars were uh, a small packet of... of French nobility that got together, originally uh, nine, um, to go forth to, the story was, help pilgrims in the Holy Land um, travel freely and safely, uh, which then, of course, as history has shown, uh, gathered more fans and followers and members, and uh, one of the 
biggest fans there of being St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote the primitive rule to govern uh, the order of the temple and essentially codify it as a monastic knighthood. Um, they were answerable only to the Pope, uh, meaning even local magistrates had to uh, let them, give them by uh, and allow them to carry on their business as they saw fit, which uh, allowed them to become exceptionally brilliant bankers, um, which of course, as we know, uh, drew the ire of uh, uh, King Philip the Fair, the last name or the, the, the nickname of the fair referring to his looks and not certainly to his temperament or sense of justice, um, who influenced the Pope into um, the what is now the uh, October 13th uh, arrest of the Knights Templar and uh, the subsequent trials and uh, in some cases executions of those that didn't flee, uh, notably that of Jacques de Molay, the last uh, Grand Master of the Knights Templar. Uh, the Knights Templar were alleged to have dispersed to uh, Portugal, where they actually did become the uh, Knights of Christ, which is a standing order that still exists today. Uh, other rumors were they went to England and Scotland and into uh, what is now Switzerland, uh, which you can also see emblematic on their flag. And also ironic that Switzerland is also, at least at one point, known as a very large banking hub for the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, in more recent terms, the uh, interesting Larminius, tra <laughs> Larminius Charter uh, was discovered uh, in the 1800s uh, by Bernard Ramon uh, Falber Prat, which I apologize, French is not my first, second, or third language, um, which which lined out a succession of grandmasters following Jacques de Molay, and he being the last one on this particular charter. The authenticity of that charter is uh, considered somewhat dubious, uh, if not completely, if you're a diehard academic. Um, but it does bring forth and forward into the modern age the ideas of what the Templars stood for, what they were uh, seeking, what they were fighting for, what they were hoping for, um, which also then made its way, either depending on what you read and or believe prior past into Freemasonry. Um, and then from there, we have uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and the York Rite, which has a body in it, the Order of the Temple, which I am the, the grand prelate of the state of Minnesota for. So I am the Grand Chaplain of Knights Templar in Minnesota. <laughs> Very cool. So, and I should clarify for uh, for our viewers and listeners that modern Templarism is is a very diverse uh, yes. phenomenon. Yeah, and and there's a whole lot of different groups. Some of them are independent groups. Um, some of them are parts of Freemasonry. Some of them may not be officially part of Freemasonry, but have connections to Freemasonry. Some of them have nothing to do with uh, Freemasonry. Many of them are, are schisms from that Larmenius Charter that Brother John mentioned, right? Um, but are completely separate separate groups, and they all do all sorts of, of, of things. <laughs> so just, yeah, that's just, just, just to be and, clear. It, and it's it's amazing because usually when you get more close to your current timeline, you're able to actually taper the information down. But the closer we get to the modern age, it actually fans out um, yeah. into everything from. Freemasonry to the uh, OMSTJ, other uh, Templar Collegia, all these other groups, and up to and including uh, influence on our own uh, AJC. Yep, precisely. So, so just getting that clarification out there, but and also to clarify because you know, John, your main um, experience with. Templarism is with Freemasonry. So could you talk to us about the connection between the Templars and the Freemasons? Well, uh, it, yeah, the, the problem is actually uh, the connection is, of course, theoretical because there's no uh, traceable historical secession there. Um, there's a lot of people that hope there is. I, I hope there is. Uh, I 
don't believe there is, but, uh, you know, once again, you hold out hope. Uh, Templarism, the lessons learned, the, the theories of, well, I don't, not even theories, a lot of the practices you find in the uh, primitive rule have somewhat evolved and adapted, and those lessons can be found within the uh, lessons of craft masonry, uh, furthermore into the York Rite and Scottish Rites, and then definitely within the Order of the Temple, uh, within Freemasonry. Uh, the Order of the Temple is the, the last uh, order or last degree in which you can receive in the York Rite of Masonry by uh, petitioning and not being invited in to other bodies. Uh, and so it's it's a body in addition to craft lodge masonry. I uh, don't like to say it's higher than. Uh, it just happens to happen after you do those degrees. So it's an it's a build up thereof or a support thereof, much like your uh, Scottish Rite. Is. Right. That's there, there's either a real, that that's the very concise without falling completely down the rabbit hole and uh, like you said going on for about three shows. Uh, <laughs> The no, nuances. And admittedly, there's people far more astute than I am, uh, who thankfully are my friends that could even go further. No, exactly. And especially for a show like this, right, where we don't want to be going all night. I right. think that that's a, a, a great summation. Thank you so much for it. Can I, um, oh, um, please. Yeah, I feel like I maybe want to jump in with a question that uh, is kind of also connected to what you were saying there about how it fans out, the notion, notion of, of things fanning out. Um, yes as things get more present. And so like this is uh, slightly tongue in cheek, uh, maybe I'll say, <laughs> um, because, but it might actually also provide uh, some interesting context to why, how what you're doing maybe is, is a little different or a little more focused, uh, more intentional, more positive. Um, so that's kind of, I'm laying the groundwork before I ask my, my somewhat sarcastic or, or uh, um, pointed question. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, I love those. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, one, of, one of the first ways that I encountered the Templars was through um, Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum. Um, and that book is pretty critical of, of well, like a lot of uh, esoteric thought. Um, and, uh, but also I think very like um, uh, inspiring in the, same, in the same breath with a lot of these uh, channels of thought. But there's one thing that always struck with me. Um, uh, one character is speaking to another and he says, uh, the lunatic is all, ID fix, and whatever he comes across confirms his lunacy. You can tell him by the liberties he takes with common sense, by his flashes of inspiration, and by the fact that sooner or later he brings up the Templars. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, uh, like, the reason I asked, the reason I, I put this forward is that I think what, kind of what you were saying about how people hope that there's a connection, they are, or they're claiming there's a connection, they're using certain documents or certain statements as their way of, of holding on to a connection. Um, uh, but yeah, so I guess the question I'm asking is how do you navigate through, I think, uh, the various uses of the Templars in, in, in channels of esoteric thought? Well, uh, with me, it's a little interesting because I'm, well, especially being among seminarians and, and whatnot, and I'm a career investigator, uh, just like, state, county, retiring at federal before I left for private sector. Um, so I'm a, like, I'm a big fan. I don't live in Missouri, but I'm a big fan of the 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 uh, motto of show me. Um, in addition, when I was doing my master's work uh, and graduate work, I was mentored by some very, very brilliant academics, uh, especially in the areas of ethnic studies and anthropology. Um, so I'm a big fan of being able to make sure that you can connect dot A with dot B, dot C with very solid connections and being able before to say, before you can say, yes, this is a thing, making sure those bonds are there. Now, I understand that people can make leaps of logic, leaps of faith, things of that nature. Um, and that's fine. I understand that if, if two things look alike and by all rights, they seem to belong together, then they probably do. But as an academic, you have to say, for me, I would have to say, here's what I believe, here's what is likely, here's what may be because of 
internal consistencies of these two moving parts. The people that say it is and it is this because they take a part from here, a portion from here, a portion from here, cobble them together and say, I've now made a chain, doesn't hold up to robust uh, academic scrutiny. So I, again, like I said, I really hope that there's a, a viable and a discoverable and a completely verifiable connection. Um, but you know, I'm a consummate pessimist as well. So I can, I hope at one moment, but then I, you know, I want to see those dots connected. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, staying with that, um, there is there's been attrition for for a very long time now that the the Templars were actually secretly Gnostic or esoteric. Now, now they were tried for heresy, and the heresy seems to be uh, the demon worship. Uh, we don't really or witchcraft, perhaps. Uh, we don't really have any specific indications in this charge of heresy that the heresy was Gnosticism or Manichaeanism or any other tradition that we can say that's a Gnostic tradition. The other thing too, uh, for the, the Templars being disbanded for heresy, it, it does seem that that this was a plot to capture the uh, the lands and the holdings and the money right. uh, of, of the Templars, right? So all that said, Going back, a lot of people think it's actually like a, a, something that happened within the last couple hundred years. But if you do some research, people start thinking that the Templars had secrets, secret teachings, esoteric teachings, not perhaps an inner core at least of Gnostics. Go, this, this idea goes back a very long time. So, so John, what do you think of that idea? Were the, the, the Templars secret Gnostics or secret esotericists instead of being good, good Catholic soldier boys? <laughs> I from from all of my reading research and uh, and studies, I would have to I would have to say yes. Um, I mean, even their 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 patron uh, uh, Saint Bernard, um, he was a doctor of the church. He was well read. He read well beyond what uh, Catholic clergy of the time would have considered in scope. Um, the same with you know. St. Thomas and other doctors of the church. So it, it would lead me to believe that that would have an influence on the original order. Now, addition into that, um, one of the heresies they were uh, accused of, uh, of violating or engaging in, I should say, was worshiping either the head or what was a, a idol to the head of St. John, um, which again, seems very fitting because Every craft lodge and masonry is dedicated to St. John. He's brought up several times. And the Yonite tradition is nothing, it's nothing new, um, but always treated with great scrutiny by uh, the individuals out of Rome, as it were. And at the same time, there is very good evidence to show, or at least definitely allude to, the fact that, well, one, Knights Temp the original Knights Templar allowed non-Christian uh, individuals into the ranks, up to and including the rank of sergeant. So they were never, those individuals were never knighted, but there were Muslims, Arabs, Jews that were there in a support and a, uh, uh, both the support from a day-to-day -day aspect, but also from a battlefield support role that were not uh, Christian, were not, uh, didn't take the uh, oaths of monastic lifestyle that the knights did. And you're also sitting in an area where you have, like you said, Manichaeism. Uh, the one that sticks out in my mind is the Druze have been there uh, in that area for quite a long time, as well as uh, Sufi mystics. Um, and they engaged with those particular groups uh, to learn, to trade. Uh, they were they were traders. They made money. Uh, they made money well. Well, you make money well by engaging with the people whom you are entrenched with. Um, when they weren't at war, they were cordial with their neighbors. Um, for the, I mean, for the most part, there's always an exception. Uh, I, I'll be the first person to point that out. Uh, but you do that by involving yourself, by immersing yourself, and trading knowledge and and different 
ethnic or social traits, stories, backgrounds, legends, epics. Um, and so there's no, I have no question in my mind that they learned lessons there, propagated, propagated them, brought them back to uh, the Western part of Europe. Um, in addition to now we're running into when they come back, we're running into groups such as, you know, we're talking Cathars, uh, we're talking um, several of the other Rosicrucians, um, it, eventually evolving into Rosicrucianism and in my mind, eventually evolving into Martinism and other groups like that. Um, so yeah, I would say that they were definitely uh, students, if not very astute practitioners of esoteric thought, of a more universalist religion, um, and of things that would have gotten them in trouble with the Church of Rome, because they're, they're, uh, the line there is you don't, you can't get to heaven except but through the church. And the, the church is controlled by the vicar of Rome. So once again, you're giving up your worldly uh, hierarchy of lords, princes, and kings to those of the church, uh, which caused a problem because the Templars brought home lessons that said you didn't need to do that. You know, it was it's the Gospel of Thomas, kingdom of heaven is inside you and all around you. And I think that's where they finally found a, a reason and ability for Philip Fair to finally uh, be able to get his money on on the Templars' coffers because he owed them the most out of <laughs> any of the nobility of Europe because he was heavily indebted to them. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think you're really on to something. And of course, that that needs to be a whole show or panel where where the were the Gnostics actually, uh, uh, or sorry, were the Templars actually Gnostic? Uh, because uh, there's some uh, some suggestive evidence, just like what you were saying, but but there's even more than that. And what gets me is the, the so-called Abraxas gems, you know, an ancient symbol for the uh, Gnostics that hadn't really been used much in the 500 years before the Templars came along, and then they started using it as a seal, uh, and it starts popping up in their iconography, and it's... Um, if people want to look it up, it's the, de the depiction of the entity Apraxis, uh, who is very striking, and you can't really say that it's anything else, uh, as no. well as that their name is around <laughs> it. Now, sometimes there's a squiggle or a star or, a, you know, half a cross in a circle, and you, those History Channel-style shows will be like, well, you know, this, this triangle that kind of looks like a triangle, but it's a little bit smudged here, proves that, that the, the Templars uh, start at the moon program. Uh, the, the, <laughs> some of the stuff I'm talking about is much is is much more solid than that. Still mm -hmm. not proof, but much more suggestive. And yeah. you know, you can't look at something like the Abraxas gem and be like, well, you know, that's not an Abraxas gem. So you know, uh, I, I think there too. Like, there's always that question of like, uh, were the ancient Templars Gnostic? Um, and there's a uh, like what, the the thing I've often heard about, which is like, were they were they capital G Gnostic, as in specifically following a lineage of a particular thought and text? Or are they small G Gnostic, which is to say recognizing that there's something weird about the world and maybe there's a different way of accessing a different kind of truth than like, and that like it's it's more like whether or not they were officially Gnostic, they're definitely in the genre, you know? Yeah, and I was gonna say that, I was gonna say they were definitely small G, and you use the exact words I was gonna use. Um, yeah, they were definitely small G Gnostic. Uh, big G, I, I'd be hard pressed to say that. Um, it, it leans that way, it shows that way, but to be able to concretely say that, I mean, that's, that's a bold statement, uh, even for <laughs> the esoteric uh, <laughs> typhonery that uh, is the history of Knights Templar. Yeah. Typhonery, well yeah. done. <laughs> I'm writing that down. That's a great word. <laughs> so, John, uh, you're a Gnostic seminarian. Uh, what do the Templars mean to you, like, as a Gnostic seminarian, in, in the specific 
uh, uh, identity in the specific way when you're doing your seminary papers, when you're thinking about your ministry? W what do the Gnostics, what do the Templars mean to you then? And, and why should they matter in general for, for modern Gnostics, for the modern Gnostic movement? So it's a two-part question there. Ooh, that, and that's that's tricky for me, actually. You'd think that would be the easiest question. Um, Templarism for me, uh, in a speaking as a seminarian, um, it affects me. Well, to be fair, it affects me a little uh, a little differently. Um, so my family history, my mom was a very big uh, genealogy uh, up to 10, 15 years ago. Um, and she's traced some variants of my family line back to as far as 1385. Wow. Um, and one particular variant of it uh, from Bohemia, which is why I have that wonderful last name. Mom's Irish. Couldn't get that one. Nope. Um, <laughs> so, but but the, the my Bohemian line uh, is of uh, lesser nobility, but uh, local lords and and of the like. Um, at one point, there was an uprising uh, regarding, I think they were referred to as barbarians, but they were just not accepting of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, apparently at that point. Uh, but a request for aid was put out and the Templars from France and from Italy answered. Um, and because of that, and the call for aid was the, the last ditch Hail Mary because they were about to lose everything. Um, and I wish I could go into more detail, but it's been a long time since I've, I've looked at this. Uh, but the, the end run was uh, Templars came out of everywhere and scared the hell out of the enemy and ran them right on over. Uh, and because of that, my family line was able to continue, hence why I'm here. So... It, for the same reason I joined Freemasonry, the same reason I, I, or at least compelled me to follow uh, the seminary route with the AJC, is um, paying it back and paying proper homage to those that <laughs> I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them, literally. Um, so that that spurs me on, that keeps me going. Um, it should get me going better and faster because <laughs> I've got a lot more papers to write than. I've been getting done properly. Um, but from that standpoint, uh, from the fact that I'm a firm believer that they were the couriers of the knowledge from East back to the West, or at least from, you know, the Holy Land to Europe and to be able to spread it there, um, you know, and again, through the different groups, you know, communicating the Bogomils, everything else, and allowing that tradition to continue on under the radar, but still carry it, give it to other groups that can keep carrying it and keep carrying it. Um, so that's that's a big thing, uh, I think, that sits in my mind and every time I'm working on anything involving a seminary is there, there's a lot there's a lot of historical weight that we are carrying or at least trying to give a due shake and due diligence to uh, so that weighs heavy uh, on that component. Now, I think the second half of your question was, uh, essentially, do we need Templarism now? Uh, yeah, and more specifically for modern Gnostics, you know, for, for our both people within our own community, but outside our community, other churches, independent Gnostics, of which there's quite a few, right? People find out about Gnosticism, they don't have a church nearby. Well, I'm going to adopt this as my worldview and religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bingo, right here, and see, they let you in, um, yeah. because the nearest church to me is several hundred miles away, and um, yeah, it's that's exactly what it was. Is uh, my study of Templarism had brought me to Gnosticism, which had brought me to the AJC and then into the seminary. Um, so I think the the principles, the spirit of Templarism is still very alive and well. It may not be recognized as such among the the general populace, I guess, but for those that are that are seeking, it's easily found. Um, and much like in the past, uh, one thing leads you to another, which leads you to another. 
Uh, once you start studying down one rabbit hole, you can't help but start looking down other ones uh, yeah. and start seeing how the web of everything is is connected. And I don't mean that in a <laughs> in a conspiracy theory way, but we all have a commonality, a common uh, family tie, if you will, uh, and with how we our our beliefs are carried out, how we how we're uh, structured as groups, how we are. Uh, carry ourselves within the world. Um, so I think that the spirit of the Templars are alive through what we do every day in the world. Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, we can dig into that a little bit more, kind of specifically with with concepts around chivalry, right? It's, it's not really... Um, a concept I would say that many people are familiar with in the modern world. Uh, very few live by a chivalric code. Uh, so what does sh chivalry mean to you, John? So chivalry, and you have to take out the whole um, maiden in distress mentality that may come when people think of chivalry, especially in this day and age. Um, because now we're, we're ideally and hopefully living in an age of equality where that is less of a thing um to point out like my my wife is not a a, a damsel in distress she's a black belt and has a right hook like a falling safe <laughs> however <laughs> um with the other concepts of chivalry is it's do it's it's uh you rectify your actions act properly you know, treat it, it's it's good conduct. It's it's upright and just behavior. Uh, it is acknowledgement of the greatness of the creation, uh, giving your giving uh, your creator their due guard, due uh, their dues, uh, what they're owed, um, and also representing what you hope the best parts of your creator are. To your fellow human being, that's that's going to be your modern, uh, in my rough and messed up estimate. Uh, that that would be what I would call modern chivalry. Um, you know, we practice it. Our our three main oaths in Knights Templar and Masonry is, you know, you safeguard helpless orphans, bind the wounds of the afflicted, feed the hungry. And essentially do no wrong. And I think those are pretty good guide points in which to to live by day to day. I mean, it's and those aren't that's that's uh, uh, there's symbology there or a symbolism there. Um, you're not going out there every day and and actively binding the wounds of the afflicted, but every time you give a a doting ear, help somebody talk through an issue, give them your time, your attention, play catch with your kids, those things. Um, you know, feeding the hungry, yeah, that can include, you know, physical, actual food. Uh, but it also includes spiritual food, emotional food, um, you know, uh, the social food, these things that you can give somebody else. And that is how chivalry needs to be it remains the same but just is applied in a more global and larger sense today yeah yeah exactly exactly um well that leads in quite nice which i i think you touched on but chivalry in the in the modern world if people hear that the term they, i mean they probably think that you're joking right <laughs> um to be honest yeah um, it's you get a lot of the can spam looks of you know wondering how cheesy you are as a human being um yeah and so it's 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 not for the uh the faint of heart or at least those that are willing to uh just kind of fold their cards and walk away without either explaining or better yet exemplifying it do, and so do you think that it is relevant for the modern world? And that does it need to be updated in some ways for the modern world? I think, well, with regards to updating it, if you take those concepts of chivalry and remove them from the literal sense, 
and use them, like I said, more thoughtfully, more into more of a spiritual sense. I think there are just as applicable, if not even more so today than, than in earlier times. Uh, I think chivalry has a place uh, with that particular uh, philosophy today. I think it's something that men and women can practice. Uh, again, it's, it's just an upright conduct and it's, you know, being a good neighbor in a can, you know, don't seek a fight. Uh, but if somebody needs you, you don't run from that fight, uh, whether it's intellectual, verbal, um, or physical. Now, that doesn't mean you go in swinging. That means you go in smartly and hopefully using heart, mind, and words to diffuse and, and aid and assist in all situations. Yes, in my case, that would be those, those would be my options <laughs> if I was yeah. running into a fight. No, I'd listen to my harsh. Yeah. Maybe my mind and my words. Right. Oh. And and with me, I have, to be fair, I'm a veteran and veteran yeah. cop. So I have to remind myself to calm down because as an Irishman and an ex cop, I tend to run my mouth, which if you ever hear me on my other podcast, I'm very good at. Yeah. Um, but it's a matter of you use those those concepts of chivalry to to use what you can best for the situation to come out the best way it possibly can. That's a lot of heart and a little bit of thought goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, sorry, give me one second here as I bring up summon the magic question sheet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh okay here's here's a good one here's one another one relevant to to today's world unfortunately and and i wish i wish it wasn't um which is uh john i'm on the internet too much and <laughs> if i'm on the internet i'm often googling about esoteric stuff and about templars and i actually literally get ads uh, but also find a whole, just like I was saying at the beginning of the show, a whole lot of different groups uh, who seem to combine Templarism with far right. And I'm not, you know, I have no problem with people who uh, who have right wing uh, uh, political beliefs. Uh, but I mean, alt right, far right, <laughs> uh, racist. Um, and they see Templarism as a as a modern white man's army to sort of rid the Americas and Europe of of people of different ethnicities. Uh, and, and maybe the most famous example of this was was the infamous uh, Norway mass shooting, where where the shooter claimed to be a uh, Templar who was uh, preserving Norway from from people of other races. So, would you say that this is an accurate representation of what Templarism is about? Oh, absolutely not. I think it's, I think it's, uh, let me see how I can word this and not slip into my uh, usual diatribe I would in my other, <laughs> any other setting. And remember, I'm wearing my collar. Um, I think that that philosophy is held by people who are easily distracted, who haven't done all the reading of all the things to be read that they should be reading. I think that's the best and most polite way I can possibly put that. Um, Short-sighted and it's, well, it's just stupid. Um, when I was studying both undergrad and graduate, uh, my dou I double, uh, double majored, uh, but my secondary major was ethnic studies, and my focus was a lot of studying these groups back then. Now, this is 20 years ago. Um, but even then, these, not so prolific as it is now, but Templar symbolism would come up. Um, I mean, and that's, that's through no fault of, one, it being used historically. Now, admittedly, People get things like the Templar Cross and other groups uh, rather mixed up, um, especially like Teutonic Knights, uh, because the Black Cross, the Teutonic Knights, was used heavily by the Reich, who were trying to obviously give themselves a tie to the past and, and find legitimacy. 
uh, yeah. in what they were trying to pitch. Exactly. And that's carried forward. Now, we also live in a, in a, a country right now that's the last 20 years of the culture has been war because that's what we've been doing. And we're doing it in the Middle East. And the problem is people see it as history repeating itself. And the Knights Templar was the most prolific group, at least, or dare I say infamous group, uh, of the Crusades, you know, overlooking things like Knights of St. John, Knights of Malta, uh, Order of St. Lazarus, uh, all these other orders that were involved. They've affixed onto the Templars because the Templars have, you know, been shown through history to have who have won many battles against Saladin and his Saracen army on several fronts throughout uh, their time there and even prior to Saladin. Uh, but they're focusing on these battles against, uh, quote unquote, you know, the the red blooded white man against the foreign invaders. Okay, well. Yeah, a lot of that was against, you know, the United Arabs, um, Kurds, Turks from the area. But one, Knights Templar, again, they took everybody in uh, just because just you weren't a white Christian didn't mean you didn't have a home in, in Templary in the original order. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to get knighted because that was a monastic order, but... Again, you had a home. You were welcome. You were treated as a brother. They bought and traded with their neighbors. Again, Saracens, Turks, uh, Kurds, Druze, everybody that was in that area, Jews. So again, there's a, a logical fallacy with what whatever it is that these groups think they're doing. Um, and they learn from them. Uh, again, like we said, a lot of the esoteric knowledge the Templars brought from east to west, they learned from their neighbors while they were there. And these were people of not, well, they weren't French and English. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and I have a really hard time when I see uh, marks of the old order, the order of the temple. Uh, being used in such ways. I don't even like it when I see it. I'm a motorcycle guy uh, through and through. I ride constantly. Um, and I see guys with, you know, they've got their, their Templar crosses on and stuff like that. And it's a little different there. Usually, usually there's some crossover between, but I don't hang out with those guys. Uh, but, you know, it's it gets co-opted for any sort of kind of tough guy, lone wolf type of thing. So, and it even bothers me in that standpoint because the the lessons, the values, the, the the creed of what the Templar stood for then, as well as their descendants now, don't jive with anybody engaging in wearing in or you know saying that they believe in or belong to these groups that engage in extremist activity with regards to, you know, people of different races and religions. Yeah. So yeah. To, to kind of jump on that um, a bit is like, what if like, so, so you're, um, you're a contemporary, like sort of esotericist, Gnostic, um, not you specifically, but just in general. And, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're inspired by the Templars, you're, you're making a lot of the connections that you, you yourself have point, been pointing out here that I think are incredibly valuable. Um, but then you see all of this iconography being adopted. Um, like, is there like, d like, do you, do you sometimes have to say like a Templar, but not like those guys? You know, is it a, is there always a caveat that needs to be added? Like a- I think uh, the only caveat you need to add in that kind of circumstance is Templar, those guys aren't. Mm -hmm. um, oh, because mm -hmm. that is dead on. Um, it's what I do is a variant or a descendant of Templary. What these extremist groups do are not. Um, neither the original order would agree with it. St. Bernard would not agree with it. 
uh, I think no. deep down. Uh, the, 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 the church they served at the time, I would hope, would not agree with it. And I hope they don't agree with it still. Uh, so they, again, I can, I can call myself a master chef, but I can burn toast, <laughs> which means I'm not a master chef, despite how much I want to say I am one. Sure. Just to, to press you a little on this, though, is that, uh, like, I, in terms of self-definition, I completely agree. Uh, and when you have the space and time to kind of discuss it, I guess I'm kind of saying or, or questioning that that there are there are going to be, uh, like, the, you, as you move in the world, you're going to be interacting with people for whom the, their first interaction with the term is uh, is such that you're that's what you have to work against, if that makes sense, versus yeah. uh, allowing, like, they, they don't have the body of knowledge to be able to to make that to make that assessment with you to say like oh yeah it's totally not tem templarism what they're doing they just know that these guys call themselves templars and they did this stuff recently so like right. that's kind of more what i'm talking about like how do you how how do you navigate uh um communicating with somebody who might not have that context um and that you need to dis like distance yourself from this uh, yeah so and I, and i get that and well i mean that's that's Thankfully, I'm slightly adept at that, being a Freemason who used to be a Roman Catholic. So I had to do a lot of explaining on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of it is you have to provide context. You have to at least give them, paint the picture for them without going completely down the rabbit hole. But you need to be able to uh, show the inclusivity Um of what the original order stood for, what they were formed to do, um, what they did, uh, which is pretty easy to do. Again, you know, you explain who they were, who they were surrounded by, and how they learned from them, and why that is completely in contradiction to these groups that don't want to learn from their neighbors, who hate their neighbors on spec because of their appearance, who are not they're not a spiritual group they are not warrior monks they're saturday morning schmucks <laughs> um and so yeah you, you you do have to dance around or at least work your way through that preconceived notion but i think it's a lot easier said than done once you start painting the picture of what these guys do are so, is so way over here compared to what templars originally did which is this, 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 and this. Bind the wounds of the afflicted, feed the hungry, worship, worship the one, you know, or the, our creator. And, you know, I think once you at least paint the picture for them, then they can make a, a rational and intelligent uh, decision of their own, uh, regardless of which way they decide to, to go on that is up to them. But yeah, it, it, you you can't go into it doing the no true Scotsman theory of you know those guys aren't Templars like me. You you need to totally separate it. Like I'm a Templar, they're not. Um, it's not they're Templars, but it's they have no absolutely not. And you have to build that firewall and make sure it is utterly utterly just straightforward and and blatant almost if you have to. Right. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we discussed a lot about how to sort of differentiate uh, between uh, the good, positive, Gnostic, light bringering uh, warriors of light, modern Templars, and the dark, racist, demiurgic, archonic <laughs> riders of darkness. Templars. The archons, knuckle draggers. Yes. Uh, yeah, knuckle, knuckle dragging archon uh, uh, Templars that we have running around out there. Uh, but so there's the tying them apart. But if some of these Nazi and racist groups are using Templar symbols, like how do we fight it? I think the only way that's a and that's a big question is how do you, yeah. especially when it's you know, uh, basically embracing the concept of a himsa, radical, nonviolence. Yeah, uh, you have to fight it by being an outward example of what it actually is supposed to be. 
And I don't mean running up and down the sidewalk with a sign, you know, saying, hey, look at me, I'm supposed to, this is how Templar is supposed to be. I mean, if you want to be that, that hoo-ha about it, that's, that's fine. But again, being subtle about it and living it and being a walking example of it without having to scream to the rafters that you're a walking example of it, that is going to be the single best way to defeat it. Will it happen overnight? No, not by this process. It won't. Uh, but it is the the single best way to do it. Because um, as much as I as, as much as twenty year old me would enjoy a good scrap, uh, I there's there's no way of winning through strength of arms alone, as one would say. Uh, you know, it's again using your heart and your wit. Right, right, exactly. I, thought, I guess that 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 is the answer that you know I was secretly looking for, and the the answer that that I also agree with. Though duels with authentic twelfth century uh, gear, it, it is. I'm just putting it out there. It is. It is another possible solution. <laughs> I mean, if we're gonna play on the even playing field like that, no, yeah, I suppose. I mean, if we could. You know, bring back American Gladiator and just make the results, you know, legally binding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, we're we're getting to time, unfortunately, but it's been fascinating, uh, Brother John. Um, thanks so much for for coming on, and we hope to have you and fifty or sixty of your uh, co-hosts on <laughs> as well. Uh, and this is actually a great place to to flow into a plug. Let me bring you up here, and I'm going to bring up the plug for after lodge so if you could tell the other people at home a little bit about that just say the addresses too because some people listen to it as a podcast yeah so it's afterlodge.com uh it's a podcast that i'm on i'm actually one of the two guys that are now probably considered the color commentary uh what what the the podcast is uh is essentially what would happen when masons after finishing their lodge meeting would do sitting around a table uh, sipping bourbon and or coffee or both um, and talking about kind of whatever comes to mind. Now, any particular lodge, you talk about some both some very deep things and some things that are so ridiculous that you're happy you're gonna, you can actually share it with other people that revel in the same lunacy that you do. Um, so that's kind of what that podcast is. It's a lot more off the cuff big red shoes, creaky red nose, clown wig kind of uh, podcast than, than this is. So it's been very difficult for me to completely mind my P's and Q's over the last hour we've been recording. <laughs> well, it, it's a lot of fun, but you guys have some pretty deep conversations too. Yeah, thankfully, yeah. we. Yeah, I mean, because most of the guys on there, uh, myself excluded, are pretty astute. Um but we also have some really good guests on there. Um, we, we've had Father Tony on there, uh, right, who, yeah. who blew our doors off. Uh, and we we like to get in depth, um, and we also like to see if the in depth people can you know hang around and do some yuck yucks after kind of talking deep, because uh, that always shows a really good content of character if you can keep up with us being complete nodheads, um, you know, and be willing to speak down to us proletariats on the podcast circuit. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Well, thank you so much. And I'll move over to, to Jason here. Jason, any plugs? Uh, just the usual. Uh, you can find me at uh, jasonmemel.com. Um, uh, the spelling might be a bit weird, but it's at m e h m e l dot com, jasonmemel.com. Um, that's where, where you'll get links to all of the other stuff that I've got going on. Um, I also, my day job is that I uh, run a theater company, Sage Theater, uh, sagetheater.com, S A G E theater with a Canadian spelling, so it's an R-E at the end, dot com. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a festival coming up in June that we're getting ready for and some other little projects that we're trying to kind of kickstart as those go. And um, yeah, that, that's all the, the plugs for me. Perfect, perfect. And now I'll put the spotlight on me for my plugs, which the first of is Mile End Meditation. And I know I slur my words, so for the people who are listening, as opposed to watching the YouTube, that's what we're in, Mile. 
and then the word end, and then the word meditation, all one word, .substack.com. I do uh, free, secular, open, psychology-based meditation every Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Montreal time. Uh, we've got a great group of people who come out. It's great for both beginners and for those who are more experienced. We meditate for an hour, but don't let that scare you because we flow through a few different techniques and we take a break and it's uh completely free uh, i'm going to be doing it forever it was originally it was a request to do it for uh COVID from some some friends and former students uh but now we are going to be continuing to do it in the future once things open back up and we'll just be broadcasting it uh there with the uh uh with the live people uh also um while we are still locked down semi lockdown things are pretty locked down here in montreal i can't find the banner so just pretend it says on the screen holygrail.substack.com that's holygrail.substack.com that's my my parish in montreal we usually meet every second sunday in the evening 7 p.m eastern standard time because what good gnostic is going to get up early in the morning to go to church right that's yeah. No one's going to have the reason I joined. Yeah, that's precisely. Yes, that is the main. Yeah, that is our main outreach technique. <laughs> um, so, uh, of course, usually you wouldn't be able to visit us if you're not in Montreal. But we're going to be doing these online for at least the next little while. The formats changed a little bit because we can't you know, celebrating the mass uh, uh, digitally. Just, just doesn't. Uh, 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 do it for for me in our community. Although there are some some advantages to doing that as well. So we um, uh, it's more of a meditation night, uh, so, but more of a mystical meditation, more of a Gnostic based style of meditation. And then afterwards, a uh, discussion, usually on a Gnostic theme. If you want to check that out, and you're like. Is John going to try to get me to join a cult? Or will I have to instantly adopt a bunch of doctrines when I show up? Absolutely not. Come and go as you please. And uh, I can't speak on behalf of the Apostolic Illinois Church, uh, but I I can say that in my experience, in my experience as a spiritual seeker, uh, the communities are very open. They're not going to ask anything of you, make any demands, except to be you know polite and open and receptive, uh, just and to contribute as as you see. Is appropriate. Uh, so, you know, I, I've been to most of the parishes around North America now, and, and it's always a positive experience. And again, there's not going to be any demands made on you. So feel free to uh, join me online or another AJC parish online while this lockdown and semi lockdown continues. And when things go up, if you need a little shot in the arm in this brave new world of some spirituality of some great folks, and you're able to get to a parish, I say definitely check it out. Okay, so that's it. John, it's been uh, so great. Uh, I learned so much, and uh, I really think it's been wonderful having you on here. And we can also tell, too, that, of course, these are very important topics, topics that are relevant for for today's life, uh, relevant for people's um Progression is spiritual beings. You know, I bet you there are some people out there interested in modern chivalry and may want to apply it to their their um, their day to day lives, to their spiritual lives. I'm really glad we got to have that discussion at the end, too, just because I I, I too have a, a great fondness more more than a fondness, a great connection. Uh, a great thanks for the Templar tradition. So obviously I, I get very angry and sad when I, mm -hmm. I see these racist pretenders um, out there trying to defame uh, the names of, of, of this great tradition, which of course this is, you know, spoiler alert, this, this is how it works. This is how it works down here in the Demiurge of the world. But uh, we're doing our best to contest it. So uh, on that note, uh, I'm signing off, Deacon Jonathan Stord. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody.